Welcome back to Flashpoint History's War of the Worlds. This is Episode 8, the al Mohat. In our last episode, we talked about the fractured mess of Al-Andalus after the fall of the Umayyad Caliphate. How these states, in desperation of being taken over by the Christian kingdoms of the north, invited in the al Moravids of North Africa. As we left off in the narrative, eventually the al Moravids were brought down by a combination of uprisings, the increasing strength of kingdoms like Castile, Aragon, and Portugal, and were finally driven from their home in Morocco by a newer, more powerful, and more religiously orthodox faction that was bent on their destruction. In this episode, we're going to see how the Iberian Peninsula and the Crusading Era became a ferocious battleground once again especially as more militant and religiously fundamental views became firmly entwined on both Christian and Muslim sides. In 1099, Jerusalem was approached by a massive Christian group who considered themselves to be pilgrims, except that they were armed and not just with material weapons but with religious ideas. Nearly four years prior to their arrival, they had been given clear sanction to, quote, liberate the Holy Land and secure the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This sanction was given to them by the Pope Urban II who offered remission for their sins if they were to engage in pilgrimage, and of course this came with the caveat that they could destroy anybody that opposed them. Thus, they were given a religious license to kill with the motivating carrot of getting into heaven if they stayed true to the cause. They were so motivated that they fought their way to the Levant for years. It would become one of the most difficult journeys a mass migration of people have ever willingly endured. On July 15th in the year 1099, this army, because, you know, let's call it what it really is, breached the city walls and entered the holy city. What followed were days of carnage and wanton destruction, which, to be fair, was kind of standard for the time. The chroniclers of this event, and we're lucky in that we had more than one account of this, all talk about how the soldiers had to wade their way through blood. But here's the thing, the soldiers who did this felt justified and righteous in what they had just done. For them, it wasn't just about the plunder. Now I realize I'm coming down hard on the Christian pilgrims, or as they would later be known, the Crusaders, as this was the first crusade, but it needs to be stressed. Christianity by no means held the exclusive rights to warfare that would be deemed holy. The Muslims, too, had been declaring holy war or jihad for centuries, but even they did not invent the concept. Holy war has been an intrinsic aspect to society since there was civilization and, sad to say, religiously motivated conflict would continue to be entangled with humanity. And maybe the greater question would be why? A great writer, philosopher, and novelist from the early 20th century is Aldous Huxley. He's one of my favorites. Huxley has a quote that readily comes to mind. Of course, he was writing this in the 20th century, but I feel that his statement not only transcends history, but is also really profound. Quote, The surest way to work up a crusade in favor of some good cause is to promise people they have the chance of maltreating someone. To be able to destroy with good conscience, to be able to behave badly and call your bad behavior righteous indignation. This is the height of psychological luxury, the most delicious of moral treats. End quote. Now, I agree that this one quote is way too simplistic a response for such a poignant topic. And by the way, I'd love to hear your thoughts and input on this question. But you have to admit, the essence of Huxley's response would be one of the major driving factors on how the Islamic and the Christian worlds would gear themselves up to interact, and not just in the Levant. In the aftermath of the First Crusade, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem would be established and crusading orders would come into being to protect it. And there's a good chance that you've probably already heard of some of these. You had the Order of the Temple, the Templars, the Order of the Hospital, the Hospitallers. I mean, there was at least a dozen more. These crusading values and constructs would make their way back to Europe and would take a decisively fertile hold on the minds and political policies of Western Europe, including Hispania. Now, let me give you a really good example. 
St. James, also known as Santiago, as I've mentioned in the prior podcast, is the patron saint of Spain. There is a pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain where his bones are believed to be kept. Christians believe that this man was a humble pilgrim who was martyred in the cause. But it was during this medieval time period that his image changed from Santiago the Pilgrim to Santiago Matamoros, that is, St. James the Moor Killer. Chris Loney in his book A Vanished World puts this really well. Quote, a new type of pilgrimage was emerging, and the new pilgrims bore not walking staff but sword. These won entry to heaven not through lives of penance and good works, but through victory or death in a holy war against Christendom's enemies. Pilgrimage became war, and James the Pilgrim became James the Muslim Killer. The world now turned perfectly upside down. Pilgrimage turned to war, cleric to warrior, and St. James himself to arch-warrior patron." End quote. Even the concept of military orders came to the Iberian Peninsula, and there were several, but the most prominent was the Order of Santiago. Its motto, by the way, Rubet and Cis Sanguine Arabum, which means, the sword runs red with the blood of the Arab. Now, I've also heard the translation, and think about this one for a second, because this comes across almost like a prayer, May the sword be red with the blood of the Arab. Either way, it's meaning it's a cross. It's not exactly subtle. More than a hundred years after the fall of Jerusalem, this motto and the ideals that inspired it, the concepts behind the crusading zeal, would be put to the test in a decisive confrontation and put to the test against an arguably equally fundamental orthodox doctrine but an Islamic one. Two armies arranged themselves on a field in July of the year 1212. One was a crusader army that, in a somewhat rare but soon to be much more common scene, consisted of contingents from all over Christendom. They had been brought together for a common cause under the King of Castile, Alfonso VIII. They were united by a common faith and sanctioned by a pope in a justified holy war Make no doubt about it, this, to them, was a crusade. And on the other end of the field was a relatively new player to the scene, an Islamic group who had grown immensely powerful. In their rise to power, they grew to dominate North Africa, a large swathe of southern Spain, and in the process had laid waste to entire Christian as well as other Muslim armies. They too were united by their faith, which surrounded their doctrine the ones who profess the unity of God. In Arabic, they were called the Al-Muahidun, and to the Spanish ear, the Al-Muhad. This battle that they were about to engage in would prove to be one of the most decisive. It would go on to determine which religion would dominate the peninsula. It was known as the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa. But how did we get here? Who were these people after all? I mean, imagine for a second being a soldier on the line, boots on the ground on either side, with the firm commitment in your mind that the fight ahead was going to be a righteous one, that it was agreed upon and approved by your pope or your caliph. So I guess we really need to have an understanding of the backstory to this confrontation. And this begins in Morocco. The history of the al mohad is unfortunately very similar to that of the al Moravid, who they replaced. They both came from Morocco, originated from Berber tribes, started with one man's quest for religious clarity, and they were both structured around the ideals of reform and establishing a more rigid doctrine. To make matters worse, they both sound a lot alike and have the first four letters in common, so you'll have to excuse me if I go out of my way to enunciate the differences. That said, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Tumart was born approximately in the year 1080. By this time, the al Moravids were well on their way to establishing their hegemony over Morocco and would later go on to invade the Iberian Peninsula. Ibn Tumart was a Berber of the Masmuda tribe and was brought up in a very humble household, but he had a passion for knowledge. 
he pursued his quest for wisdom by first traveling to Cordoba, which was still a center of learning, and then far out to the east, to Baghdad. He arrived at the Abbasid capital during a time that was regarded by historians as the golden age of Islamic philosophy. It was here that he came into contact with the teachings of the Al-Ashari school of thought. This was a Sunni-based canon with a heavy emphasis on the orthodox interpretation of Islam. It was said that during this time he came into contact with Al-Ghazali. This man was a prominent philosopher, theologian, and Sufi mystic, and his works were profound. He single-handedly wrote over 70 books which would influence not just Muslims, but would affect the thought process of people like Dante, Hume, and St. Thomas Aquinas. Ibn Tumart learned as much as he could and began to develop his own doctrine of faith, which was based on a very puritanical view of Islam. This view was especially aghast at the laxity that had come to the Almoravids. The wine, the selling of pork, the decadence, the fraternizing with the enemy, men wearing veils. And not to go into exquisite detail, but his view on religion rejected the human aspects of God, the anthropomorphisms, which Hugh Kennedy, a professor of Islamic studies, states was really splitting hair to some extent. But think about it from his point of view, he needed this deviation in belief to establish his manifesto. This would later also give him a really good reason to attack the Almoravids and pretty much anybody else that he deemed a non-believer. By 1117, Muhammad bin Tumart returned to Africa and began to preach, and he was a firebrand. But in general, he simply made a massive nuisance out of himself and was escorted out of one city after the next. But here's the thing, this man was only getting warmed up. In 1120, he got to Fez and started to challenge the establishment. First, he simply wanted to debate. And then later, he started to assault people, including the sister of the emir, who at the time was Ali ibn Yusuf. Now, just between me and you, I would say that this is probably not a smart idea in any country. However, he managed to get out of Fez, and then later that year, tracked down the emir himself in Marrakesh and challenged him to a debate. It was during this back and forth that his words got him into some serious trouble as he was deemed to be blasphemous. Even the emir's counselors recommended executing him. They were like, hey boss, this man is a lot of trouble. Give us the word. You know what? Just point in his general direction and we can make him disappear. Heck, we even got a nice little hole in the desert dug out for him already. But, in one of those really strange and ironic points in history, the emir, despite having his own sister assaulted, decided to just expel him from the city. I think if this emir had the ability to somehow look into the future and see what Ibn Tumart was going to unleash, I don't think he would have been so generous. I guess, in the end, the emir was just a nice guy and he figured that Ibn Tumart was nothing more than a simple-minded madman who would likely just run off into the wilderness and live in a cave or something. Now, just as it would turn out, Ibn Tumart did leave the city, he did run off into the wilderness, and he began to live in a cave. But he continued to preach as well. His doctrine began to really catch on, and followers and money began to pour in. In 1121, he gave an especially powerful speech. And during the speech, he proclaimed himself the Mahdi. The term Mahdi has several different meanings. The word itself has been more developed in Sunni than in Shia Islam. Literally, it means guided one, but it implies a divine guidance, hence one who is a type of redeemer. In Sunni Islam, it also has a connotation of one who will come at the end of times to reestablish righteousness. Thus, if you call yourself the Mahdi, you have to feel like you're on a mission. And I can tell you without hesitation, this man was. His message spread, and by 1124, Ibn Tumart was able to set up his base in Tin Mal, which is in the High Atlas Mountains of Morocco. He went from being a preacher to an organizer of the members of his movement, and he gave them a name. Those who proclaim the unity of God, the Al-Muahidun. Thus, the Al-Muhad came into being. For the next several years, the Almohad had to run a guerrilla operation out of the mountains. They hit Almoravid supply convoys, depots, and the vulnerable mountain passes, especially the one that connected Marrakesh with the city of Sijil Masa. 
This was the northern hub of the sub-Saharan gold trade, so if you're going to hit anything, hit that. In time, an organized government structure developed, with an inner circle called the Assembly of Ten, and a second tier called the Council of Fifty. This gave the various tribes who decided to come together a reasonable voice in policy making. But the High Command always remained a close-knit, almost family affair. As can be imagined, the military wing of the al Mohad also adopted a strict hierarchy, which was divided into ethnic units. The bottom line was that you had a very effective system, and the stage was set for expansion. All that was needed was an aggressive leader.